welcome to episode four of the Rebel Report. This week, we take a look at how both men and women's basketball teams did in the Mountain West tournament held at the Thomas and Mac. We will be speaking with athletic director Tina Kunzer Murphy as our in-studio guest. The UNLV baseball team had a ribbon-cutting ceremony to introduce their new clubhouse, and we took a special behind-the-scenes look at all the gear that is needed to swag out the running Rebels. That and more coming up next. Hi there, and welcome to another installment of The Rebel Report. I'm Cassie Soto. And I'm John Castanino. You know, March Madness has taken over the Strip and the city. Last week, four conference tournaments played right here in town, including, of course, the Mountain West Tournament at the Thomas and Mack Center. The tournament didn't pan out for both men and women's UNLV squads, but both teams had flashes of brilliance in the early rounds. The Rebel Report's Joanne Mendoza starts us with the men. At the Thomas and Mack Center, the UNLV Running Rebels host the Mountain West Conference with hopes of advancing to the NCAA Tournament. The Rebels opened up the tournament last Wednesday afternoon with a triple overtime matchup against Air Force. Senior Ike Wamu tried to close the game out with three seconds left but missed the buzzer beater. During overtime, the Rebels played a tough defense, stopping Air Force from scoring on them with one second left, sending them to double overtime. Freshman Pat McCall drives down the middle lane, trying to score against the Falcons but misses the backcourt. Heading into the first triple overtime game of the Mountain West Conference Tournament, the Rebels managed to pull away from the Falcons, beating Air Force 108 to 102. I mean, to be honest, we're a little exhausted. I'm a little exhausted right now, but um, you don't think about that while you're playing because at, at this time of the year, you know, it's winter go home. So you just got to push through that and then um, take care of everything after the game. With tired legs, the run-in Rebels took on Fresno State Friday night with their backs against the walls. The Rebels quickly trailed the Bulldogs by six, freshman Steven Zimmerman with a key shot early on. Jerome Seegers with the pass to Zimmerman for a huge dunk in the first quarter against guard Julian Lewis. Moments later, Zimmerman is received with a technical foul after pushing Lewis as he came down from his dunk. As the Rebels came into their second half of the game, they continued to trail Fresno State by seven, showing a lack of defense. Freshman Pat McCall with a huge deal against Marvell Harris early in the second half, sending momentum to the Rebels, but it was still not enough as they continued to fall behind Fresno State, losing to them 82-95. to This would end the season for the Rebels. Senior Ike Wamu with final words for the season. I mean, we were, we were battling hard, but um, you could tell on a few shots that we didn't have the same legs, so um, that's not an excuse, but I mean, it, it did play a role. After one dramatic finish and a tough loss to Fresno State, the Running Rebels hope to look past the season and on to the next. For the Rebel Report, I'm Joanne Mendoza. A lot of question marks for the team moving forward. Athletic Director Tina Kunzer murphy hopefully will clear many of those questions for us later in the show. Now, the Lady Rebels fought for a chance to make it to the Mountain West Championship game for the first time since 2002. They came one matchup short of that goal this year. Summer Crawley shows us how the ladies still made history in their tournament run. It's March and it's tournament time. The UNLV Lady Rebels secured a spot in the semifinals for the first time since 2009. The Lady Rebels and the Bulldogs of Fresno State took the court last week at the Thomas and Mack Center. In the first couple minutes of the first quarter, Nikki Willie with the ball who then finds Brooke Johnson across court who puts up UNLV's first three-point shot of the game. Here it goes again. Amy Calloway feeds Dakota Gonzalez the quick-release three-pointer to tie the game at 6-6. Down by 20 in the third quarter, the ladies found themselves nailing shots from behind the arc and attacking the hoop with authority to keep from trailing behind the Bulldogs. UNLV continued to stay in the game with back-to-back three-pointers and strong putbacks. This soon led the young squad to build up its momentum run. When it came to the last quarter, the Lady Rebels rallied up to cut the lead to single digits with critical points being scored. The Rebels attacked Fresno State to the paint and it started to dominate inside and out in the final remaining seconds of the game. Wheatley uses her strength and hops to draw the and one play to make it a four point game. Dakota secures the steal and Dylan Gonzalez is there for the putback to make it 62-60 with 27 seconds left. Fresno State came out as victors who went on to beat number one Colorado State in the championship game. We had a lot of fight. 
Um, we were down by 20, brought it back to a one possession game. And um, like I said, I'm just very, very proud of this basketball team. Definitely um, exciting knowing that we were able to kind of really come together at the end of the season and pull it out. And honestly, it's tough because a lot of that had to do with our seniors. And uh, so losing them is, is, is going to be a big loss for us. But at the end of the day, we know we have young guys that are willing to step up and, and, and uh, basically fill, fill those roles. And so we're excited about our future. The ladies fell short in the semifinals with a tough battle against Fresno State. With the young team, the Rebels look forward to its upcoming seasons. For the Rebel Report, I'm Summer Crawley. UNLV finishing this season with an 18 and 14 record, but we have to make sure that we look for this team. They've got a young core and they should do very well uh, next year in the Mountain West Conference. I'm sure many Rebel fans have been curious to know what kind of shoes the players wear. Yeah, what kind and how many pairs? That's really the other question. I Too many. Know, and we're going to find <laughs> out right now. Before the end of the basketball season, the Rebel Report's Luis Negret met up with some members of the UNLV equipment staff to tell us about what kind of shoe fanatics they deal with on the Renner Rebels. Have you ever wondered how the UNLV's men's basketball closet looks like? Or what it takes to prepare all their gear on game day? Thanks to the help of Rocky and Aaron, we're able to bring you a quick look into the behind the scenes. Every year, the UNLV men's basketball roster is filled with sneakerheads, including Patrick McCall. So this is Patrick McCall's locker. Obviously, you can tell he's got quite a few pair of shoes here. Um, some of his are ob actually obviously over in the uh, locker room for the game tonight. But uh, you can see he's got some Kevin Durant, some Jordans, some Nike team shoes, um, whatever he's going to wear that game. Patrick's one of those guys who changes shoes a lot. He's not very consistent game to game or even halftime to halftime. Once he, he just wants to wear something that's very comfortable on his feet. That's his goal every day, and sometimes that shoe varies. So he's one of our most unpredictable guys as far as what he's going to wear. We also got a preview to his game day closet. McCaw has anywhere between Kobe's to Jordan's and Sometimes some Nike exclusives, some pennies. Or these are Scotty Pippins, actually. Another player with an interesting collection of game shoes is Ike Wamu. This is Ike's uh, basketball locker at the Mendenhall Center. This is where he stores all his stuff. Um, Ike does a very good job, keeps his locker nice and neat. So as you can tell, he's got quite a few pair of shoes. Some of them are his, some of them are provided by the team. Um, each player has shoes they like to wear for particular games, you know, whether we're wearing white uniforms, they may want to wear a white shoe or gray uniforms, they want a gray shoe, red, black, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they'll mix and match their shoes and their socks to match whatever they feel that day. Sometimes when they have a good game in that shoe, they'll keep sticking with that shoe because they've been playing well in it. Sometimes they'll have a bad game in a shoe, maybe even a bad first half, and you'll see them they'll come in at halftime and change their shoes. Yeah. I didn't make any shots this half, so I'm going to go grab another pair of shoes. So um, Obviously, Ike's got a lot of shoes, Nike shoes. He prefers to wear the Nike uh, regular shoes for practice and then he wears all his Jordans and everything like that for game day. He's kind of a Jordan guy. As you can tell, he's got pretty much every Jordan there is, it seems like. Ike also owns a pair of the arguably most hyped Jordan shoe of the year so far. People say 10s and 11s are probably one of the most comfortable shoes to play in of Jordans. So that's what he goes with are the 10s. He has another pair of 10s too, but he prefers the OVOs a lot. Also, UNLV has a large variety of Nike ID customized shoes. We let them order a couple pair of IDs. They get to go on the ID designer themselves and design their shoe, design it the way it is, uh, put their number on it, put their initials on it, whatever they might want that's unique to them or unique to the shoes that they want to wear. The big shoe this year, the Kyrie, was the big ID shoe everyone liked. Um, so it kind of moves in trends. What's cool, you know, last year the LeBron was the big ID shoe everyone likes. Despite having a variety of Nike ID shoes, Signature shoes are still the most popular. All the signature shoes Nike does, which is the Jordans, the Kevin Durants, the Kyries, all those type of shoes are always popular among the guys because that's what the best players in the world are wearing at that given time. So um, there's a little variable in there, you know, and then throughout the year we'll get uh, limited release shoes uh, that we can get. Throughout the many years that Rocky has worked with the team, there's one story that stands out. You get players, um, for instance, Lewis Amundsen was here. He used to, his shoes would get really heavy with sweat and water during the game. So he would change shoes after pregame and at halftime of every game. So he would literally have three pair of the exact same shoe for that game. And he would plan on changing shoes so that they would be lighter the whole game. So he wasn't carrying around all that weight and sweat and water in his shoes. The Rebels have been talked about having one of the best shoe collections around the NCAA by websites such as NiceKicks.com. From the Rebel Report, I'm Luis Negret.
quite the collection of shoes these players have. <laughs> Is that called swag? swag? Swag. Swagged out. I'll tell you what, a team, uh, uh, another team on campus has some swag that they're showing off as well. Let's go to Barbara Farkas now to tell us about the brand new piece of equipment for the baseball program. Thanks, John. A state-of-the-art baseball clubhouse can be a game changer into becoming a powerhouse program on the national level. UNLV Baseball's newest addition on campus hopes to do just that. A dedication and a ribbon cutting ceremony took place to unveil the new $2.75 million Anthony and Lindy Marnell Baseball Clubhouse on the campus of UNLV Monday, March 7th. The two-story, 10,000-square-foot clubhouse is located directly down first baseline inside Earl E. Wilson Stadium on campus. The first floor features coaches' offices, a player's lounge, study stations for the players, as well as training and equipment rooms next to each other, leading down a hallway to bathrooms and an elevator. Head coach Stan Stolte expects the clubhouse to help with recruiting in the future by having a state-of-the-art facility. No, it's going to help our recruiting and the local kids that, that are good enough to play here. Will, I think it'll be more, it, this will be more appealing for them, to them to stay here. And, uh, and we just think we'll get a better kid and, and be able to develop them better with this great building. The top floor will feature two indoor batting cages with a conditioning and weight room scheduled for installment in the coming months, as well as a patio that overlooks the stadium and the Las Vegas Strip. President Len Jessup envisions that the clubhouse will elevate the program and the university in the coming years. This now puts our baseball program among the top tier uh, programs in the country, so it helps the program in particular to be a top tier program. But also the improvements on the athletic side of the house, in addition to what we're doing on the academic side of the house, enables the whole university to rise up another level. It's, it's very exciting. Well, it's, we're just so excited. The kids actually moved in a couple weeks ago, but we haven't moved in yet, and they're just so excited to come to practice and play every day and and it's really get, move, making us move forward and a chance to to get to where we want to go. Although the clubhouse isn't open to the public, I can say firsthand that it will pay dividends in the future and postseason hopes of Rebel Baseball. Back to Cassie at the desk. Thanks Barbara. UNLV football continues its string of spring practices this week. Back on Saturday, the Rebels getting to do what every player looks forward to, putting on full pads for the first time. Our very own Victoria Bass was there. Let's kick off this new season of UNLV Athletics with some spring football. UNLV football head coach Tony Sanchez will oversee his second spring practice at the school as the Rebels meet to begin their 15 session schedule that culminates with the annual spring showcase. I want to see a steady progression moving in the right direction. You know, we're not a team that can afford to take steps backwards. We got to continue to move in a forward direction. Um, you know, we want to see a defense that, that becomes a really good tackling unit. They do a really good job of creating turnovers, assignment sound. They do a great job of running to the football. Offensively, you know, ball security, um, you know, do great decision making out of our quarterbacks and, uh, you know, and just improved offensive line play. You know, if we get better in those areas, it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, during the spring showcase, it's pretty much getting better. Like Everything we do, we get better, so when it's game time, it's easier. Coach Sanchez is always on us. Even if we're doing good, there's always stuff for us to work on getting better. And if we're doing bad, he makes sure that we do better so we don't stay in the slump. Coach always talks about attitude and effort, and I can see that the attitude and effort is just definitely the, uh, the attitude and effort of a winning team right now. Today was a real physical practice, and you can't do it every day. Otherwise, you're going to beat your guys up, and you know you got to be really smart the way you prepare. So there's a time and a place to, to full pad it up and get after it. There's a time and a place to put helmets on and run around. So I mean, again, you can get a lot of things done. It's just you know the way you go ahead and balance it. So getting you guys ready for the physicality of the game at the same time, not completely beating them up. The public is invited to attend the free family-friendly spring showcase, which will kick off at noon and be held again on campus at UNLV Soccer Complex at Peter Johan Memorial Field. Make sure you check out the spring showcase on Saturday, April 9th. For the Rebel Report, I'm Victoria Bass. Season tickets for the 2016 season are currently available as low as $79 and are on sale by calling 702-739-FANS or visiting UNLVTickets.com. Let's toss it over to John with our interview set for this week's guest. 
All right, Cassie, joining me now, and it's a pleasure to have her in our studio. It's UNLV Athletic Director Tina Coons and Murphy. Tina, I know you're a little under the weather, and you've got a bit of pressure on you right now, so I appreciate you making the time no, to come and talk with us. Uh, thank you, and thank you and all of the students that are here and uh, working on all of our sports. I've, I've seen it on our website, and, and uh, just a big thank you to John for starting this program and all the students that are working on it. I love this collaboration, and thank you for getting UNLV Athletics out one one more time. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know the students do as well. They're working really hard. Absolutely. So again, thank you for being here. And before we talk about the drama and what you've been doing interviews, it seems nonstop about that head coaching job. I really want to start and talk about some good things that are happening in the athletics program. You got Tony Sanchez bringing in his record recruiting class, the women's tennis team about to break a record. They're undefeated right now. Uh, and the baseball uh, clubhouse, which we had a story on earlier in the show. Let's start with the good things that you see this program is doing right now. Well, I appreciate that. You know, sometimes we forget that we have 450 student athletes <clears throat> that are going to class and working really hard to be I call it practicing perfect so that they can play and represent this institution at the very high level. You know, last week was a huge day for us when we opened the Lindy and Anthony Marnell Clubhouse. I know you were out there, but I, I went over to football practice this morning and took one of our donors out, and it's really a showstopper. And I was really proud because, as the students know here, so we've got 36 baseball guys. They had just finished a series. Uh, they went two and two with Ohio State, which was pretty exciting. But the locker room was amazing because that whole process is, is a place where student athletes can come, they can study, they can eat, they can be together, and, uh, and, it, and it's just a game changer for our athletic department. This morning, so I went to football, and Tony Sanchez has them going. I think it's the largest spring group I think I've ever seen in, in the history of UNLV football. And we've got um, our new quarterback that he brought in, the JC, Johnny Stanton. He's pretty remarkable just watching him. We've got a couple really nice tall targets for him to shoot at. And so spring ball kind of takes on this new different dimension because we have so many people out there. We actually had a really, uh, I said, who is this one guy? And he said he walked on. And they had a, a tryout for all the walk-ons because everybody now wants to be part of our football program, which is very cool regular students and we have a, a new freshman that walked on that's actually practicing and boy he looks he looks the the part so that was really good went over to tennis they're playing oklahoma oh, today. all over the place yeah. yeah oklahoma this morning so unlv women's tennis 15 and 0 and i would tell you i i spent about 25 minutes out there oklahoma's really good and our kids are playing their hearts out so uh yeah a lot going on and and you know women's basketball had a really good year and right and uh, men's and women's soccer are playing and track and field just gets better and better. Um, so there's a lot going on and uh, softball, UNLV softball is doing really well. Uh, Lisa Dodds, our coach, she's been here, I think now this is her third year. And they, they do a lot of tournament play early on preseason. So uh, getting ready for conference and that's going to happen here real quick. So those are all the really great things. Um, one of the things if I could talk about, we're working with uh, Allied Health to put a nutrition sta uh, station over for our student athletes and we're going to do a trial with our softball players on our Excellent. and football and the people from Allied Health are helping cooking and then they're going to be testing our athletes to see how you eat and how that transcends into better performance. Sounds like a story that our students should be doing. I think it's going to be a great story <laughs> as we kind of move forward but that's something that we're working on right now and uh, you know instead of the kids grabbing an apple or a banana because the NCAA has allowed us to do that now we've got we're, we're basically we've got crock pots and waffle makers but we're going to build a kitchen with Allied Health and 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 then have a have this pilot program for certain student athletes. Cool, and we look forward to bringing that story hopefully to us Great. soon. But you know all eyes are focused on what's happening with obviously the men's basketball program. Um, just give us a snapshot of where we're at right now. I know right. you want to hire a coach ASAP, obviously. Yep. Well, uh, you know, again, people question why we did that early on, and, and uh, you know, there were a lot of reasons why we did it, and I completely understand why, why people make the change at the end of the year, but it's very frantic right now. And this whole year went after we made the change was able with Todd Simon, Stacy Ogman and, and Ryan Miller to, to kind of understand how our program has been operating. As an athletic director, it's my job to know that, but you hire coaches to do their jobs. 
And so it's been a real eye-opener on some of the things that we really need to work on and some of the things that we're looking for. Len and I have spent way too much time. I, I'm sure he has, he has a ton of things that he's doing on campus with the medical school and, and the hospitality center that's open and just all of the academic stuff. So I really have been very fortunate to have him by my side during this whole thing. And it's been very good. We're gonna hire a coach. And uh, you know we've we've got some great candidates. I've been consistent that I'm not going to talk about who those candidates are, but the names keep rolling out in the paper. So it's kind of um, you know that's that's how it is because people are so passionate about UNLV basketball. We want a coach that can win. We want a coach that can win the right way. We want a coach that can can arguably understand their role in higher education on this campus. And uh, <coughs> I think we're going to find that person. Um, how it looks in a week now or on Monday or Friday, I, I don't know. Um, <coughs> we don't have somebody today, but uh, there's a lot of moving parts on it. And obviously, all of this is, is up on the approval of uh, the Board of Regents. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't, obviously, you're not going to give us names right now, but tell us <coughs> who these, these candidates are. I know, obviously, we have some assistants on staff. I don't know if they've interviewed at this point. A lot of reports said that they have. Um, but are they current head coaches? Are they NBA guys? Are they assistant coaches? Tell us who we're looking at to fill this position. Yes. <laughs> I like it. See, this will teach the students, yes. right? <laughs> See, sometimes you just get one-word answers that are all looking at me right And now. I never do. That's yeah. probably my problem. Our PR guys tell me mm -hmm. I talk too much. <laughs> but, you know, John, we've, well, we like that. Well, I know. We've gone back a, a long ways. But, no, you're right. I, I've talked with NBA head coaches. Um, I've talked with head coaches at Division I institution, at Power Five conference institutions that are currently working and that have just stepped away from their positions. And I've talked with head coaches that are, um, that are in uh, mid-major conferences um, similar to the Mountain West. And then we have an assistant head coaches, associate head coaches pool that have also been head coaches too, but are now currently in those roles. Um, talked with commissioners, talked with uh, GMs, talked with agents, talked with presidents, talked with athletic directors, talked with coaches that I have in the basketball field that are very well known, that have been very helpful in kind of guiding, you know, what works. Coaches that have been here at UNLV, and uh, I'll throw a couple names out. Jay Wright, who's, you know, at Villanova who loves Las Vegas and uh, has just been a tremendous help to me. I knew him when he was here and uh, kind of giving some guidance and I, and I really appreciate oh, that. Lon Kruger, who takes time almost every other day to check in on us and we're family friends, but you know, people that have been at UNLV that loves this program that wants to see us uh, do well in this search and it's such a big search. So, so those, are, those are all of the folks that we, we've talked with and now as we kind of whittle it down, you know, and try to figure out who's the best fit. And also financially, you know, I would tell you that that's a, that's a, it's a tremendous commitment talking to some of these people. So we're trying to work out those things. And uh, so it's, it's trying to make sure that it all pieces together. And uh, the beautiful thing about this program is that there's so much passion, not only from our fans, but from people on the outside that, that believe this program should be a contender, contender for the Mountain West year in and year out and going to the NCAAs. And I think that's what we all want and that's what we all expect. And I don't think there's anything the matter with that. Those are our expectations. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and obviously that was a point that I wanted you to make. Um, how long is the list right now? Are there more candidates being added or do you have your kind of your list and you're, you're just trying to it's funny. pick out one? Um, you know, I've had, so, so late in the game, we've had a couple of coaches that have called in. I just um, did a 20 minute visit over at the tennis courts, walked into a room and talked with somebody. And a couple changes have been made, um, division one. So, you know, there's some really good coaches out there. So I wanna make sure that I talk with everybody. And uh, each time we talk about it, you know, we're pretty, we're moving down the road. But again, you don't wanna miss an opportunity to talk to somebody that may just step out and shine and, and be that, that person. You know, we've been moving steadily along, narrowing the list. The list was pretty big, and now it's 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 smaller. And uh, you know, we've got people playing in the NCAA and the NIT, and uh, so we'll have to wait a little bit. And we have you know assistants that are have shown a lot of interest in our job too. So. Mm -hmm.
So we're going to wait and see. And now it's the waiting game. Yeah. So it is, I know a little the, bit the of tournament's wait. here now, so maybe things quiet down a little bit as far as what you can say publicly. But right. uh, I, I also want to say, you know, we've got three assistant coaches that took over this job at a very difficult time. If we hadn't had those injuries, if we hadn't started with Ben Carter and then Zimmerman and then Dwayne, and then uh, Jerome actually hurt his foot, and then the horrible news on Derek Jones Jr. with the a APR stuff. You know, those three really pulled it together and did a remarkable job. And I, it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Stacy Ogman, Ryan Miller, and Todd, Todd Simon for leading this crew. I met last week when our season was over and talked to the student athletes about, you know, the season's over, but the year isn't. So let's finish strong, finish school, do it the right way. And they've just been remarkable. Thanks, Tina. Thank Best you, of John. luck with the hire, and hopefully everything comes to fruition and we I'll get be the back. greatest coach. Uh, yeah, exactly. Coach. We'd love to have uh, you uh, and coach. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks, All right. John. Let's move on now. We'll keep the show rolling. We're going to uh, learn how to throw a curveball by the end of the show. But first, let's find out the Outstanding Rebel of the Week. Cassie? Last month, we introduced you to Janine Petmecki, the Rebel softball first baseman that won Outstanding Rebel of the Week award. Today, we go back to Eller Media Stadium, where another softball player was given the honor. Leonardo Shower introducing us. For the second time in one month, a UNLV softball player has been named Outstanding Player of the Week. This week, the honor goes to Elisa Battistini, a freshman utility player who pitched an outstanding game in last week's UNLV Classic game. As the Rebels battle for a Mountain West Conference Championship, the individual player awards are piling up. While happy to be recognized with the Outstanding Rebel of the Week award, Battistini insists her accomplishments are due to a team effort. I was really proud of myself, but I'm just really thankful that I have a team like I do because softball is not an individual sport, it's a team sport, and so I wouldn't get recognized for anything without them. Battistini earned a 2-0 record in one start and three relief appearances, allowing zero earned runs in 14.2 innings. Her performance also earned her the Mountain West Pitcher of the Week honor, but in spite of all the accolades, she's got her sights set on the game set to come. It's a good taste to like be recognized and it's really cool to have somebody recognize your hard work and your performance, but at the same time it's short-lived and you have another week to prepare for, so you have to move on from the past week and get working on the next competitions. Head coach Lisa Dodd praised the hard work her team is displaying on the field and says Battistini has been a key contributor throughout the season. I think Allie has potential to be anything she wants to be. She has great talent, she has great mentality, um, very tough mentally, you know, never quits, never gives in, uh, always trying to learn, student of the game, always trying to make improvements and, um, and work on things, asking a lot of questions. Uh, her potential is endless and, uh, you know, she keeps playing the way she's playing. I think she's, she's going to have great success over her career. And, and Allie is great at all and, and has, has really done well for us in the pitching defense area. And, uh, you know, when she gets at bats, she makes things happen as well. So um, I think uh, she's doing a great job and, and the utility always helps. Following her stellar outing, Battistini got a start and a relief appearance in the Rebel Classic Series last weekend, picking up a win against DePaul. For the Rebel Report, Leonardo Shower. The Rebels had a great weekend, going 4-0 behind an onslaught of offense led by shortstop Gary Blando. The team's record now at 14-10. This weekend, they head to California to play in the Easton Tournament. Follow the action live at UNLVRebels.com. As Tina kunza talked about earlier in the show, UNLV baseball hosting Ohio State in a four-game series this past weekend. The Rebels ended up with a split against the Buckeyes. Two wins, two losses. Unfortunately, we were there to cover one of the losses. Nakai Berry breaks it down for us. The Rebels, coming into the game with one win under their belt against the Ohio State Buckeyes, are fiercely defeated Saturday afternoon 20-3. The Buckeyes put two runs at the scoreboard quickly in the first inning. In response, the Rebels hit a pair of singles for one run. But things get out of hand for the Rebels in the third inning when the Buckeyes score five times, loading the bases, then getting a pair of doubles. Kyle Isbell makes his way to home for the Rebels' second run of the game. OSU continues to load up the scoreboard with six runs in the fourth, followed by single tallies in the fifth and sixth, and four in the seventh, while UNLV stares back with two sets of eyes, 0-0-0-0. The Rebels score for the third and final time in the eighth. You start using guys that uh, that you wouldn't normally use, and uh, they didn't come in and do a very good job, and, and that's how games get away from you. They start off swinging pretty early, so we kind of got on our heels on defense. Then we didn't help our pitchers out by making some errors on defense, and offensively we didn't have enough good at-bats, so that's the bottom line. 
Despite that outcome, the Rebels have now won five of its last seven games. UNLV sitting on the season at seven and eight. The team will head to Fresno this weekend for a three game slate against Fresno State. This week, Rebel Report's Justin Guzman had a chance to catch up with one of the pitchers from the Rebel Baseball team. Oh boy, team. I can't wait for this story. <laughs> UNLV Baseball in full swing, as we've alluded to. So with that in mind, here is this week's edition of Show Me Your Skills. Hey Rebel fans, I'm here with Blaze Bohall of the UNLV Baseball team, and he's going to throw us, uh, show us how to throw a curveball. In this week's installment of Show Me Your Skills, Rebel starting pitcher Blaze Bohall tells us why he likes his curveballs dirty. The dirtier curveball you have, the harder it is to hit. The dirtier so. the curveball. Yeah. I like that. The dirtier the curveball. So can you show us how to throw a dirty curveball today? I, I can try, yeah. Yeah? Okay, cool. And everyone's got a different grip, but this is mine. I hold it with the horseshoe. Okay. Um, and then I really just try to focus on snapping that curveball off. I keep my middle finger right on the laces, so it's, it's got to, it generates a little more power with that spin. The main thing that I try to focus on when I'm throwing my curveball is really getting out in front with it. Otherwise, sometimes I'll have my arm kind of back and that's when the, the curveball will float. Sometimes going at the guy's chest and that's not where I want it. I want it closer in the dirt. Look at the break on that pitch. That dirty girl needs a bath. He made it look so easy, I thought I'd give it a try. Now, when I'm throwing it, is there something I'm doing with my wrist, elbow? You almost want to focus on like snapping that curveball, almost like you're snapping your fingers. Oh, okay. Just getting out there and getting so, that snap so off to it. Over, yep. Nothing with, so regular throw, but at the end. It's just, the just like a fastball up until the end. Okay. And just turn and snap your fingers. All right. Oh, dang it. Hey, that ain't bad. That ain't bad. I want to say thank you to Blaze Bohall for showing us how to throw a, uh, throw a curve. Thank uh, you. How do you think I did? You did good. You did very good. That's great. That's what I wanted to hear. A oh, little, little more practice and you'll be on the mound here soon. All right. Well, maybe, like you said, call it, you heard Blaze. Maybe I'll be here. A couple, uh, you know, some practice. And you never know. All right. So for the Rebel Report, I'm Justin Guzman. This is Blaze. Tune in next time. It's a good thing that Justin is a journalism major because he obviously cannot hack it as a pitcher, <laughs> and I think Blaze was just being nice to you, just so you know. Um, that is it. We're done with show number four. What a done. great way to end it. And I'm looking forward to spring break next yeah. week, definitely. Yeah, I know. So the students get the week off, so no show next week. Uh, I'll be here on staff, though. I'll be working in case anybody wants an update on what's going on um, with you and Elfie. But that time off gives you a chance to catch up on our previous shows on our YouTube channel, Rebel Report UNLV. Also, tweet us if you have any sports stories for us at Rebel Report UNLV and follow us on Instagram at Rebel Report underscore UNLV. We'll see you in two weeks.